Hello again. So this is going to be the second part of Wednesday, 23rd, uh, September 23rd class, since uh, we're doing it on fully asynchronous uh, in case the storm ends up affecting you. Uh, the second uh, portion, as you know, is going to be about behaviorism. And we've seen already last week that the good old uh, classic sort of behaviorism has sort of been worked out of school. Of course, we do still use it in the sense that every teacher relies on rewards to some extent, so therefore uh, positive reinforcement. But we've seen that the, the, um, the true genuine commitment to it, uh, to behaviorism as a, a whole classroom management approach, has shown its limitation, particularly if we look at uh, students with challenging behaviors. Uh, but we have also said that uh, behaviorism is still present in, in 21st century education in the sense that it has now refined itself into sometimes more sophisticated uh, and, and, and a little bit watered down as well, uh, modes of, of behaviorism. But that flavor is still there, so we still feel it. So it's in grit already. And I'm not going to go through over this again because we watched that video and we had a, a discussion on the historical progression of GRIT. I am going to add a few resources since a few of you have said that you were interested in, in looking at GRIT uh, as a strategy in the classroom. So I will add that to um, the lesson for, for today as well. But another example, since this whole um, you know session now today and next Monday is about showing you some strategies, some tools that are being used by the theory. So one example that came to mind is CBT, so Cognitive Behavior Therapy. So again, it's not pure behaviorism, but there's definitely a very strong behaviorist flavor still in that tool. CBT is used a lot, so you are going to encounter it in the classrooms. I can guarantee you that very quickly when you go into your practicum. Why is it so popular? It's popular because it doesn't require licensing. Anyone can do CBT. You don't have to be a clinician. It's perfectly okay for teachers to use CBT. So that's a huge pool for schools, right? It's a free resource that doesn't require a sort of professional development. Well, it requires professional development, but not certification. Um, it's also something that is very useful for very specific problems. So it's shown a great degree of usefulness for very specific issues and issues that we encounter a lot in school. So for example, CBT is used enormously in terms of procrastination, overuse of the web, um, you know, issues that most students are going to encounter and therefore you are likely to be able to deploy CBT in the classroom with, with a variety of students. So let's go first of all, looking at what are the key features of CBT. So cognitive, cognitive behavior therapy basically is an approach which um, it's very useful when people are stuck on patterns, on pattern behavior. So if they are able to identify that they go through a pattern which is counterproductive and leads them to outcomes that are not the outcomes that they want, you are basically sitting down with them and, re and, and inviting them to think of a different way to process. So if they've identified that a certain uh, way of process of, of progressing through their behavior leads to negative outcome, you sit with them, you give them some time to think, can support them in that reflection but you're not giving the solutions and you are encouraging to look at other ways they could organize their behavior to hopefully lead to a different outcomes and this is a reflection that's really done in the here and now so it has no ambition of opening pandora's box when it comes to wider uh, factors or variables that may be affecting their, their their behavior that's not the point you're not looking again at trauma uh, anything um, you know, sort of really sort of psychoanalytic. It's not the it's not the purpose here. It's really to look at you are having an issue, you're having a challenge. Is there a different way for you to approach this challenge? Uh, it's also very in terms of outcomes, it's very time specific as well. So hopefully you are seeing that person, the time frame of a CBT intervention is normally very narrow. So hopefully you have the availability, access to that person and the opportunity to have debriefing that are very quick. So hopefully within a week, sometimes less than a week. You want to very quickly see whether the different approach works. That's key to psych to CBT because it's that positive reinforcement. A person is, uh, needs to have time to debrief and realize that yes, they have reached a different outcome. That outcome is positive, and that you're going to work on that satisfaction as a positive positive reinforcement to uh, encourage them to stick to the rethink or the redesign that they have carried out. In practice. Um, this really uh, could be very applicable to, as I said, procrastinations, issues with homework, issues with certain behaviors in the classroom, mild behaviors in the classroom, bad habits, let's say, um, issues with internet use or excessive internet use, um, 
little things that the really the key here is that it's the client themselves, the student themselves, who's identifying the problem. So usually they are coming to you and saying, I have a problem with this. So you're accompanying them in that reflection. They think of a different way of doing that. You meet them again. You check whether, in fact, there has been a positive outcome. And then you really support them in this reflection that there's been a positive outcome. That should be the reinforcement that they require to stick to the decision that they made originally. And then hopefully this becomes a new habit. That's why it's behaviors. It becomes a new habit. Um, the stimuli is now the satisfaction of having reached the outcome. It leads the person to stick to the new habit and to integrate it into their lifestyle. Um, so, for example, if you have a student who comes to you and says, I have a problem with, uh, with homework. Um, I leave school. I go home. I get on the net. I have intentions of doing my homework, but then I get drawn into, uh, you know, a rabbit hole of YouTube, and then it's 11, then I'm very tired, and I go to sleep, then I come to class, I haven't done my homework, I get punished, um, and I really would like the homework to be done. So you'd give space to the person, and hopefully within the space for reflection, they would come up with, uh, you know, by looking at the problem they've identified with saying, for example, I could, instead of go home, go to the library for three hours without my laptop, do my homework, and then go home and reward myself with as much YouTube as I want, because by then I've done the homework and I'm actually happy and satisfied. And in fact, I have a productive evening with no weights on my shoulders, and I get to school and I feel good. You uh, meet with them hopefully very quickly. They identify that feel good feeling that acts as a positive reinforcement to say, you see, this has worked. Why don't you then stick to the habit, which is that you don't go home, but you actually go to a library and not take your laptop. It's a very simple process. It can work extremely well. Uh, it is completely student individual centered, in that case, student centered. Uh, the motivation really comes from the students. You are there merely as a support for the reflection and to provide the opportunities to debrief on outcomes to obtain that sort of positive reinforcement. Now, it's as you said, it's uh, it's useful and free and cheap, so it's very popular in schools. Doesn't require certification. There are limitations, and I think that's where it gets a little bit dangerous. And really, if you look at what we discussed last week, last week and what we are going to discuss now, the limitations are always the same. Behaviorism works really well, or things that are behaviorist in flavor work really well, but they have limitations. And the danger is when we have um, the ambition to apply them to problems that are really ecological in nature where the variables go beyond the individual and therefore it be can become very frustrating and a little bit, even a little bit absurd to try a behaviorist approach to a problem which is wide, which is wide and complex so although this works well for homework in real life it's been shown to work well with smoking to quit quit smoking timekeeping um you know could be small behavior issues in the classroom, such as chatting, uh, things like this. It will work well, but if you start applying CBT to something as major as trauma, as uh, grief, uh, it's not going to work, and it's going to look rather absurd. So really, the important thing is um, there are no limitations to CBT as long as it's focused on problems which are proportionate to its usefulness and to its available to to its 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 uh, its usefulness and its its capacity. If you are then trying to apply it to things that are well beyond its capacity, that's where we see limitations become because it becomes a little absurd. So there you are. This is one a simple uh, example of what behaviorism might look like in the classroom. Still quite useful to some respect with problems of a certain scope. Uh, CBT is not the only one. We've seen grit, we've seen CBT. There may be others, and you can comment on that on the on the discussion uh, chat thread if you would like. So that concludes part two of the class of September 23rd.